the, the review task force is actually obviously a bunch of people in the establishment who, you know, everybody's terrified about making a mistake, as they've always been. So the issue isn't really how can we get this closed? Um, how can we, you know, whittle this down to the, 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 the real small hardcore of genuinely dangerous people? It's what they did was they looked at the cases. They apparently spent ages looking at them. But, you know, their, their overall results have aired on the extremely cautious, I think. So that they ended up recommending to the president, look, you, there are 48 guys there that you're going to have to continue holding indefinitely without charge or trial. The centerpiece of what President Bush did. Um, you know, no, no, you can't do that. That's not acceptable. You either have a case against these guys or you don't. Um, and that's where, the, that's where I think the courage that has been lacking should have come in. Because this is not going to come to an end unless somebody says, let's all stop really overreacting about everything. Um, you know, they've, they've looked at the cases of guys who, yeah, they were out there, they were fighting with the Taliban, they trained in a camp, they may have heard a speech from Osama bin Laden. Do they like America? Probably not. Is that to do with foreign policy? Yes. Um, you know, send these guys home. They're, they're, they're the kind of exaggerated victims of something that was set in, in progress, you know, nearly nine years ago. Um, and without, without anything substantial happening... It isn't going to go away. You know, Guantanamo will have been open for nine years in January. Um, How long are we going to talk about this, Scott? You know what I mean? It's like nobody wants to push ahead with it because it's too difficult, because they haven't taken any bold action. So we could really seriously be, you know, be be talking about this in five years' time. We could be talking about this in ten years' time. Somebody has to be bold at some point. Otherwise, it stays open forever. And the fact that Nobody seems to care. I know that a significant, you know, a significant number of Americans don't care. The political elite doesn't care. Most of the pundits don't care. Um, that, that can keep going on, but it doesn't really end up making America look to the outside world as though it's addressed these problems. Um, and nor does it, of course, to the significant number of Americans who, are, who actually are appalled by what's going on. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if there's one thing to care about, if not, innocent people spending a decade, uh, you know, not knowing if they're ever going to get a single hearing or a chance to prove their innocence as though the burden should be on them anyway. But uh, one thing is that the war comes home when we do things like this. And as you talked about, they came up with this as the the panel recommended to Obama or whatever, and he went ahead and gave in or maybe he, he liked it. Uh, And the idea was we'll have three different ways of doing this. We'll have some Guantanamo trial still, and then we'll maybe we'll bring the Guantanamo prison to Illinois and keep the same basic kangaroo process from Guantanamo. But now it'll be on American soil. And then we'll have a trial for Ramsey bin al-Sheib and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. But no, we won't. But if we do, even if they're acquitted, we'll still hold them as enemy combatants. And I get very confused as to whether... uh, any of this makes any sense to anyone, really, in the Justice Department or anywhere else, Andy, and, and, and what it portends for, you know, the average guy who gets accused of a regular crime in America in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the difference between regular crimes and, you know, and the hysteria that's built up around terrorism is that, you know, um, it's probably business as usual as far as regular crimes go. But, you know, this has been inflated so much that, um, you know, <clears throat> so many people are oversensitive about it. I mean, you know, I must return to that, that everything he tries to do, he's up against, you know, an insane amount of criticism. But, yeah, pretty much everything that they say they're going to do or or end up doing or end up not doing um, just seems to be um, confused and confusing. They sway in the wind. They see how things are going. They back down. Um, None of it's very logical. I mean, they... They shouldn't have um, revived the military commissions. They, they know full well they shouldn't have revived the military commissions. They were told by experts that, that, that these were invented war crimes that weren't war crimes at all. Um, the um, senior figures in the Defense Department and in the Justice Department conceded in congressional testimony that one of the key allegations that they're using, which is material support to terrorism, has nothing to do with war crimes, has no place in these military commission trials. But it's perfectly good to, um, to prosecute people for that in federal courts. But they didn't do it, and they didn't put their foot down, and they didn't say no. So now they're left with this shambolic system. Um, and it's just like this with everything. You know, I mean, let's look at the men who have been cleared for release, approved for transfer is what the task force referred to them at. They didn't say anybody was actually cleared for release. Mm-hmm. But they approved 
um, over half of the prisoners who are, who are still left, you know, or nearly half of them, um, about Which 95 men it is now out of the 176, they approved them to leave. Mm -hmm. um, but 58 of these guys are Yemenis. And so because this guy tried to blow up a plane at Christmas and he had been tr apparently trained in Yemen, and Obama got lots of criticism, he said, OK, nobody's being released to Yemen. And uh, he established this moratorium with no date on it. So we're now, what, nearly eight months down the line? There are 58 guys that the task force said should go home to Yemen. Nobody's being released. Now, They're when you say the task force, is that that uh, overlaps with but is different from uh, people who have had a federal judge at a habeas corpus hearing go ahead and order them to be set freed, right? Yeah, well, some of those have, have also had um, a judge in, the, in a U.S. district court um, say that they should be released as well. Some of those are Yemenis. Um, but only in one case, a few months back, you know, it was too embarrassing for them. They caught a guy who was sleeping the night at a university dorm, um, and everybody, everybody agreed that there was no reason to hold him, so they sent him home. But they're holding all the rest of them, you know, and the subtext of this is that, is that even though the task force and everybody who's looked at these guys' cases has said um, they're not a significant threat, they're, you know, um, they, are, they can be released back to their home country. Um, everybody's so up in arms with suspicion about Yemen that they're basically saying the entire country of Yemen is a potential terrorist training base, and we cannot trust ourselves to release men back to there um, without thinking that they're immediately going to be recruited into some terrorist organization. You know, I think that's a really pretty deep insult to the Yemeni people, um, to the tens of millions of Yemeni people, most of whom are living peacefully. Well... Yeah, and, you know, people get convicted, innocent people get convicted of crimes all the time in America. I think usually when they get a chance in court and they can really cast substantial doubt on their guilt or maybe even prove their own innocence. Of course, the burden is on you once you've been convicted. Um, but uh, I think at that point, we go ahead and turn them loose, right? We're not going to sit here and hold people who we know are innocent in prison, where, where even the prosecutors admit now, okay, Your Honor, we're not fighting about it anymore. The guy actually is innocent. But that's what we're doing at Guantanamo, continuing to hold people after the judge has said, let him go. Well, in most cases, you know, in most cases where they lose, they've been challenging those decisions. Um, you know, and that leads us into a rather disturbing um, other part of the story, really, which is that when these cases are appealed, they come up in front of the Court of Appeal um, for the District of Columbia, um, which is, you know, not to put too fine a point a, a, on it, um, a court that is stuffed full with um, rabid right-wingers. Um, you know, there are guys and women sitting in that court who are making the kind of pronouncements that, you know, would put a big smile on Dick Cheney's face about um, no limits on executive power. Um, you know, so they're, they're kind of overturning um, some of these rulings that have been made. And the whole thing, again, is what's going on here. We've got a huge kind of delaying tactic. Why don't you just accept what a judge says to you? You know, you haven't got enough evidence to hold this guy. I don't care whether you say to me that this guy is dangerous because you don't have the basis on which to hold him and your evidence is tainted torture has been used you've got unreliable witnesses you're relying on ludicrous levels of hearsay that i don't believe let the guys go but no you know it's like no let's appeal it um let's keep this whole thing dragging on dragging on well andy um, and that's a bit that gets to me and without people having sensitivity scott i think for the prisoners who are held you know in this unique position normally when you're in a prison the judge said, I sentence you to X years, and you know how long it is. And these guys, it's open-ended. Um, you know, that's ruinous for people's mental health. Hmm. It just goes on and on. That's not, a, that's not a great thing for the president, for his people, for the American people to be proud of, that nobody wants to be bothered to try and find a resolution to this. Well, now, on those open-ended court decisions that you mentioned there, uh, I thought that that was, you know, if anything, the one improvement of Obama's position on all this was that, no, he doesn't have the power to do this because the president has unlimited plenary authority, as in the uh, theories of David Addington. At least he's citing the authorization to use military force and, you know, his so-called at least constitutional powers, not these completely ridiculous John Yu, J. Bybee, David Addington uh, powers. But it sounds like you just told me that a judge has ruled that, yeah, he does have those kind of plenary powers, which must mean that that was the position his Justice Department or Solicitor General was taking, right? 
No, it actually got really, it's actually been really quite um, insane over the last few months because the administration has told... We have two minutes here, quick. The administration has told the appeals court that they don't want the powers um, to the extent that the, that the appeals court judges are trying to give it to them. They're saying, no, there are limits on our powers. Their problem is that they're relying on Congress to give them the authority to do what they do. And sadly, you know, we have to conclude that, um, that Congress is stuffed full of idiotic, idiotic people who don't know what they're doing, who are providing them with excuses for what they're doing that are not justifiable. That's the thing with the authorization for use of military force. These guys should be criminals or they should be prisoners of war. But no, everybody's actually saying, oh, in the end, it's okay. We're holding them as some third category of prisoner. They're no longer called enemy combatants, but that's effectively what they still are. Well, uh, I sure appreciate your time on the show and all the effort that you put into this over the years, Andy. It really is important that there is at least one place that people can go if they're looking for the master resource on Guantanamo Bay and this most important chapter in American history that is not over yet. So thank you again, and, and especially for your time on the show today, Andy. Well, thanks, Scott. Always a pleasure. All right, that was Andy Worthington. His website is andyworthington.co. UK. The book is The Guantanamo Files, and the documentary film is called Outside the Law, uh, both of which are easily available wherever you look with your favorite search engine. Uh, I'm Scott Horton. Uh, this has been uh, me filling in for Gustavo Ariano on the show today. I want to thank Patrick Coburn and Michael Hastings, as well as Andy Worthington, for uh, showing up and doing the show. And I also want to thank Tamika for running the board and uh, everyone for helping out. Uh, check out antiwar.com for all the bad news. They don't seem to want me, but they won't admit. I must be some kind of creature of their heaven fist. The DFK Local Station Board, LSB, is now accepting applications for the volunteer position of LSB secretary, term expected to begin at the end of the 2010 calendar year. Our KPFK Local Station Board is an elected body of this Pacifica signal area. The KPFK LSB meets approximately once a month, perhaps alternating between weeknights and weekends. Applicants do not have to be elected to the Local Station Board to serve as LSB Secretary. Any listener sponsor can qualify. The responsibilities of the KPFK Local Station Board Secretary include 1. Recording with accuracy and clarity the actions taken by the LSB at meetings. 2. Preparing minutes of those meetings, and 3. Delivering the minutes to the chair and LSB members in a timely manner. The Office of LSB Secretary is a volunteer position with a small stipend. Applicants should contact the chair of the local station board at lsb underscore chair at kpfk.org. Soul Kitchen, winner of the Special Jury Prize and Young Cinema Award for Best Film at the Venice Film Festival, centers on a disorganized young German-Greek restaurateur and his motley assortment of patrons. Down on his luck and mending a broken heart, he leaves his Soul Kitchen in the hands of his ex-con brother, leading to disastrous results. With soul music at its core, Soul Kitchen features the music of Cool and the Gang, Quincy Jones, and Sam Cooke, mixed with a Hamburg hip-hop and Hans Albers. Soul Kitchen opens September 3rd at Lemley's Royal Theater at 11523 Santa Monica Boulevard in West Los Angeles. KPFK Film Club members are invited to call the front desk at 818-985-2711 during business hours for a pair of tickets. Yeah,